The Pit of 100 Trials is a dungeon intended to be challenged at the very end of your adventure. It's a grueling gauntlet measuring 100 floors of near-continuous battles as you delve deeper and deeper through it. Despite this, the pit opens up to you as soon as you collect a couple of abilities, and it can even be attempted before even challenging Hooktail, the first real boss of the game. Sorry, Blooper. So, with the floor set, this video's topic. Is it possible to beat the pit of 100 trials before even clearing the first chapter of the game? Well, yes. In fact, I'm far from the first person to attempt this challenge, and I highly doubt I'll be the last. Nevertheless, I never did make a video like this for the original TTRID, despite having done it several times, so why not do a video like this for the remake? Seems like a good idea. In this video, I'll be your guide as we venture down the dark depths of Roadport's most daunting dungeon. Now, if you're already familiar with how this challenge goes, you're more than free to see the timestamps in the description to skip the preparations made. I would appreciate it if you watched the whole video, but if I was you, I just want to get into the tough stuff. For starters, you want to collect just about every badge you can get your hands on, provided they cost you coins. I actually forgot to pick up some badges like multi-bounds, but they largely don't have any meaningful impact from what I can tell. For badges, I strongly recommend picking up Super Appeal, Piercing Blow, and especially Mega Rush P, which can be found in Petalburg. The other badges can be bought from the lovely House of Badges. If you're short on coins, you can buy a Sleepy Sheep from Roadport's shop and hike the Petal Meadows to sell them at a 2-coin profit. This will also reap shop play rewards like shooting stars and ice storms, which you'll want to hold on to as well as gold bars, which you can sell to get a bunch of coins really quickly. What I did was get enough items to win the triple gold bars, and then continued reselling Sleepy Sheep until I got a second shooting star and ice storm, which are both great items for specific enemies you're likely to do encounter in the pit. Shooting stars are just good for dealing damage, while ice storms are effective at freezing poison puffs. It helps a lot as well that your starting item limit is 15 in the remake, as opposed to 10 in the original on GameCube. So you can afford to hold a few more niche items like PAL blocks for Dark Koopa Trolls if you feel you struggle with their attacks. Even beyond the items, I strongly recommend farming coins ahead of time, just in case you're lucky enough to find Charlatan within the pit, as the items he sells are expensive and getting the opportunity to buy Thunder Rages cannot go understated. You'll want to be able to fill your pockets with Thunder Rages if you can. That being said, you don't want to do what I did and save your game after spending any of your available star pieces. This is because Dazzle, the character who will trade you badges for them, has a rather attractive selection of badges, and you don't want to be locked out of any because you spent your star pieces on something actively bad like Happy Heart. There are 15 you can find total, which is just enough to get just about any one badge from Dazzle. Here are the locations of each star piece, which you can pause the video for if you wish to take notes. Special thanks to Jazz for creating this checklist for me, it's honestly an extremely useful source of information, and I want to give him the proper credit for it. His YouTube channel will be linked in the description as well, go give him a thank you for me. If I may make some recommendations though, I would avoid the Flower Savers, Heart Finder, and the Happy Hearts. The Flower Savers are just way too expensive in cost, and you're going to have plenty of FP for the whole pit anyway. Heart Finder would be easier to recommend if this wasn't a GameCube version, but its primary purpose there was reviving a fallen partner if after battle, their HP is zero. In the Thousand Year Doors remake, partners will auto-revive with one HP if they're defeated, so guaranteeing a heart drop no longer has any real strategic merit. Finally, the Happy Heart badges are just straight up unreliable. They can heal you in a pinch, but healing is handled really well by Mario's special move Sweet Treat anyways, and it can easily turn bad if you are healed outside of a certain HP threshold. The partner variant is especially bad, because if your HP is at 1 so that you can use Mega Rush P, you can get healed at 2 and lose out on your biggest draw for the pit, which is having high damage on your partners. Now otherwise, you can generally mix up what you get from here. Some may pick up pretty lucky for filler, power plus is good, and if you're good at Dragon Super Guards, no justification is needed to even consider quick change. But since I was playing off a save file, I was recording a video for another challenge I'm currently playing through, I ended up buying Happy Heart and Happy Flower. Neither badge is good at all, but Happy Flower is at least relatively harmless. I went and bought Flower Finder 2, since it's probably the most useful badge I could afford. Early on, FP can be really tight, and this will speed up our ability to use Koop's Power Shell by a lot. Speaking of Koop's, a lot of people will recommend ranking Goombella up because Multibunk is such a strong move, but I actually am a lot more comfortable with Koop's being ranked up. 
multi-bunk, in my experience, isn't quite as necessary thanks to how much stronger Sleepy Stomp is, which is acquired incredibly early in the pit, as putting an enemy to sleep is essentially instant death since it lasts for five whole turns, and the remake actually makes it so that none of Mario's or his partner's attacks can wake up sleeping targets early unless the attack is charged. Even if you're not aiming to beat a sleeping target quickly, it gives you time to focus on other enemies, so I much prefer just being able to dish out more damage with my main damage dealer for what feels like 90% of the pit. It also helps that multi-bunk and power bounce were nerfed where the fourth bounce is now frame perfect, and being hours deep in a pit attempt, you're bound to feel shaky thanks to nerfs. Now that that's all said and done, these are my items going into the pit. You'll probably notice lack of life shrooms, and I'm actually passing up on bringing any because life shrooms are not very good when Mario's HP will be really high. Odds are your partners will burn them, and if they do, that means Mario won't be able to benefit. It's better to just let your partners fall and stay down where you can run away to activate your Mega Rush P badge and start dishing out heavy damage. So I just sold them when they came up. They're more worthwhile for the harder versions of Free Hooktail Pit, but not quite here. That's about all the tips I have to give. If you enjoyed this video, know I'll likely be doing lots more challenge runs in this game, so you may want to subscribe if you want to see more. My next CTYD challenge video will be limiting myself to items, badges, and rules, all involving the letter P. Without further ado, let's get the show on the road. To make this challenge a bit more digestible, I'll talk about the pit in increments of 10 levels. For example, the first 10 levels have 5 different enemies. Gloombas, Spinias, Spanias, Dolbones, and Fuzzies. The enemies here are fairly easy to sweep through with coops, but we found a surprisingly high number of movers. This guy here will warp you down several floors deeper into the pit, or straight back to the entrance if you provide him with the coins to do so. I actually want to avoid spotting them early on though, because it's really important to build up levels so I can equip more badges and boost my HP and FP. I'll keep a track of how many movers I found as we go, but see if you can predict how many we'll find throughout the trip. Another one. Back to the action though, Flower Finder did not take long to prove its worth, as having only 5 FP max means we wouldn't be able to power shell more than once without a flower drop. Just so you know, Flower Finder as a badge guarantees at least one flower drop after battle, up to 3 bonus flowers. All around very handy. I found my first mover on level 1 in the pit, and the second time he appeared, it was level 6. Despite not accepting help from either, I don't even level up before acquiring Sleepy Stomp, the first pit reward down here. The Tens host Paragloombas, Clefs, Dark Puffs, Pokies, and Piters. The enemies here are stronger for sure, as Koops can no longer one-shot most of them outside of peril, and there are foes that can actually fly above his range. However, after the first fight here, we level up, boost our FP, and I take the time to let the next fight of four Clefs drop Koops into peril. With only 1 HP and Mega Rush P equipped, another one. he's able to oak hail pretty much everything here, needing only mild assistance from Mario for Paragloombas and the more stubborn Dark Puffs. We also soon received the second pit reward, Fire Drive. If Sleepy Stop is Mario's strongest attack regarding utility, Fire Drive is Mario's strongest attack in terms of damage, dishing out a whopping 5 damage against the frontmost target, and one less for each enemy behind the other. It may not be used much early on, but trust me, it will shine when we get deeper. Within the 20s lie Spiky Gloombas, Bandits, Lakitus and their Spinies, bob -oms, and Boos. Down here, the enemies are strong enough where we can't use a Peril Partner for the entire section. I tried to find opportunities to fall back into Peril here with stuff like Bandits, but it got so slow I eventually just lost interest. Though it is funny how you can grind for star points here since all the bandits respawn, and coins get continuously rewarded thanks to the end of battle bonus if you survive to the end. Most enemies in general though quickly get wiped out by Paro Koops and his power shell. The only real exception would be Lakitu's, but we could just use Goombella for them. I at one point even let Koops get KO'd when there are spiky Goombas and Boos, just so I could run away and come back so Koops could one round them. That's the thing about Mega Rush P. It's to Die for another one. Our spoils on level 30 consist of one badge, Zap Tap. It grants permanent electrified status to Mario when equipped. Pretty situational, and we'll discuss why later. The 30s are home, meanwhile, to Dark Koopas, Shady Koopas, Hyper Clefs, Parabuzzies, and Flower Fuzzies. Most enemies here are grounded, so Koops fares rather well. Parabuzzies being airborne matters a little, but only a little since Mario can ground them and it's a sweep from there. Honestly, since most enemies here can only target the front, 
it's actually really easy to sit Peril back up if we ever level up out of it. It's probably easier here than the last set of fights. Sadly, the reward for clearing the 30s is actually pretty poor. Pity Flower is widely considered to be one of the worst badges in the game. If equipped, it restores 1 FP if Mario takes damage 30% of the time. Considering we can restore FP really easily with Sweet Treat, and it's generally a bad idea to take damage if we can help it, this badge isn't going to see any real use from me. I know I've been leveling up BP a lot lately, but I don't really plan going above 30 if even that high, because my lack of quick change will reduce how much BP I'll feel to be necessary by a lot. Onward to the 40s, it consists of Dark Paratroopas, Pokeba Bombs, Spiky Parabuzzies, Poison Pokies, and Lava Bubbles. With the exception of Spiky Parabuzzies, there's really nothing here to be worried about. But the one thing to be worried about is definitely worth worrying about. And that's largely because your only means of beating them involves Super Guards. Back on GameCube, you could damage Parabuzzies and other show-clad enemies who happen to be airborne with Electrified status, but they no longer suffer recoil now. So, Super Guards are the only option you have to beat them if you don't have items to deal damage. And since there's only two in this fight, you can imagine I don't want to burn any items here. Ended up struggling a lot to hit Super Guards here, and was forced to Sweet Treat to stay alive. I must say, if not for how much better appealing became, this could have easily turned dire for me. I went on to find another fight that was full of spiky parabuzzies, but nah, not a soul on the planet with time for that. So that's one Thunder Rage used from the shot point rewards I had earlier. It feels good to have some agency in which fights were forced to do. Another one. I have to honestly scoff at the idea of skipping the strange sack, which is designed kind of weird in this game because it, like the original game, increases your inventory limit on 20 max items, but the effect is less felt in the remake because you can hold 15 from the start. So the increase is by like 33% while it up and doubles your inventory limit in the original. Basically the same reward, but a 100% increase feels more impactful. Around now is where I really want to find Charlatan so that I can dump my coins on him for Thunder Rages, and having not seen him at all prior, I'll be honest, I was kinda scared. Still, we have to keep moving forward. The 50s conceal within Badge Bandits, Ice Puffs, Moon Clefts, Dark Boos, and Red Chomps. Around here is where Sleepy Stomp finally begins to shine. Ice Puffs are by far the most dangerous enemy here as they can freeze, which can quickly become a death sentence if Mario gets given the cold shoulder. Ideally, sedating Ice Puffs that are too high for Koops to reach will minimize the most risk, while Shell Shields start seeing serious usage as a means of lightening the risk if I miss a guard. And it's important we do so ASAP, because if Ice Puffs charge up cold air and they're higher up, we can't hurt them without items. The first fight with them actually proved to be especially obnoxious because on top of the last ice puff not letting me hit it, we saw an audience boo make it invisible too. Only good thing to come out of it really was that I needed more FP anyway. I also just, for some reason, am really bad at super guards against chain chomps. I don't know why, but it feels like you have to press B way earlier here. Aside from those pain points, the 50s weren't really anything special. Surviving them bestows upon us Double Dip, the third useful badge we find, which allows Mario to use two items in one turn for 4 FP. Not a bad badge by any means, but you need items for it to really be worth anything. And still no charlatan! Yeah. So on to the 60s, there are Dark Lakitus and their Sky Blue Spinies, Dark Wizards, Dark Craws, Dry Bones, and Frost Piranhas. Like Clockwork, if the 50s are where Sleepy Stomp begins to shine, the 60s are where Fire Drive begins to become actually viable. The worst enemy you'll find here has got to be the Dark Lakitu. Being airborne and having the chance of holding a spiny above their head is already obnoxious as all get out if you want to actually make progress. But the progress you end up making is also just slow as molasses. Koops ends up being pretty much useless here in favor of Goombella, and Sleepy Stomp's buff here ends up becoming critical so that you don't spend an eternity here. All it really takes now is one good opening, and the Sleeping Dark Lakitu will soon be sleeping with the fishes. Fire Drive also finally becomes viable down here with the presence of Dry Bones and Dark Crawl, as its high damage and ability to actually kill the former makes it a formidable tool alongside Paro Koops if we can maintain it. 
It's just a shame, though, that Koops can no longer one-shot anything from here on out. I also got an HP plus drop from one of the dry bones. Not exactly a drop to die for, but if I ever feel I have more BP that I actually want, well, I'll use it. May as well. Having now reached level 70, double the- Ah! Oh! So this is very good. Like I mentioned before, Charlatan is someone you'll want to find in the 50s or later. And finding him now, we're able to stuff our pockets full of Thunder Rages. I pick up 9 with the massive surplus of coins I had from shop point farming, eating one of my own mushrooms to make room. <laughs> now we're cooking! Before I forget, the badge Double Dip P is also awarded here, though I personally find it less useful than Mario's because partners are going to be much stronger thanks to Mega Rush P anyway, but it can definitely see use now that we've got our lightning in a bottle. Down we go, and the foes to strike the field in the 70s are Phantom Members, Chain Chomps, Wizards, Dark Who Patrols, and Swoopulous. Spoiler alert, but my inability to Super Guard Chain Chomps carry over for the Black Variety too, which is somehow worse than my ability to Super Guard Wizards. Well anyway, the enemies here are really tough. Chain Chomps and Phantom Members being immune to fire certainly doesn't help things either, much less with Swoopulous hovering above it. And the enemies here have such high defense, Koops can't reasonably muscle through on his own power either, so super guarding is especially important now. I packed power blocks for Dark Koopa Trolls here specifically, and planned on using them if we found a large number of them at any given point. They were pretty scarce, all things considered, though. At least, I think I only ever found fights of only one. Drops were definitely becoming more common, too. Both a Dizzy Dial and a Power Punch managed to drop, but I picked up neither. Reward for reaching 80 is Bump Attack, a badge that doesn't even work down here. It's not deserving of an explanation from me. In the 80s is where you're most likely to pass away in years. The 80s in this game, meanwhile, has Dark Bristles, Arantulas, Piranha Plants, and Spunia as well within them. Since most enemies here are groundbound and limited to only attacking the front, Koops is once again invaluable here. However, there are still Arantulas to fear. And even still, I spot a mover. Seems you're the one I finally let give me a ride. I've been avoiding these wherever I spot them, but now, I'll take it. Another I'm at a comfortable level now, and don't really need anything leveled up in particular. I spawned in a room of Arantulas all over, but I had a Sleepy Sheep and figured to try and lock them all in place. Though it seems they no longer are forced to all be on the same horizontal level. Well, either way, the Dark Bristle made reaching Peril really easy. And you can bet that once I got into Peril, I ran with it. With this, we've hit the final rest floor, level 90, and our last bit of help is in the form of Lucky Day, a badge that allows Mario to evade enemy attacks about one-fourth of the time. Pretty decent find. And now, we get the final few fights. Let's see how this goes. The enemies running in the 90s are Elite Wizards, Poison Puffs, Bobolks, Swampires, and the dreaded Amazing Daisies. Aside from Bubbles and maybe Swampires, this may well be the deadliest assortment of enemies we'll face. But as much of a nightmare as this section is, we really did get lucky to beat Charlatan when we did. Because odds are, our partners will not be able to hold out here. Too many enemies, and way too much potential for damage against them. So it's high time the double dip badges were finally put to work. We found a lot of elite wizards, and for those, it was just using two Thunder Rages followed by a third attack item. Why not just fire drive? Well, the first time I forgot. The second time, I actually unequipped the dang thing and couldn't use it. What even do I think anymore? But on the bright side, the game here got really generous with shooting star drops, so I was able to keep on the item assault and not spare a second thought. Levels 92 and 96 had an amazing daisy appear, and since I once had a pit death in him for another challenge I tried, you bet I was now ready to let them trounce me again. So naturally I spent my items, right? <laughs> Wrong! This is another time where Sleepy Slump gets to really shine. They're 50-50 to sleep, so just repeatedly trying to proc it and running away if it doesn't is an effective strategy. And yeah, you would not believe how good it felt to be able to beat Amazing Daisies with Sleepy Stomp. In the original, you either had to have a ton of items, or have Goombella in peril and multi bunk it to death in one turn. The rest of these fights just came down to sleeping and slaying the Poison Puffs before it did knocking up the Swampire. And the icing on the cake? We got thrown a booze sheet. Awesome. For the latter fight with this exact same assortment of enemies, 
The main difference was that I used Sleepy Stop to put a poison up to sleep that was charged with poison. Yeah, for some reason, you can still attack these even though every other puff is immune to jumping when charged. It's weird. Levels 93 and 97 were just sweeping with coops so they were a piece of cake. Really thankful that Paracoops was an option because from what I remember, these beasts don't drop star points if they explode now, while they gave star points regardless of how their death happens in the original. Though even if we entered the fights fully healed, the game was kind enough to give me point swaps, so I could have worked around this anyway. 94 actually saw Double Daisy, so Double Death ended up coming in clutch here. My second shooting star in the 90s also happens to appear here. 98 meanwhile was packed with Swampires, which just made Zaptap super important here. I just let Goombella and Koops take a dirt nap while Mario gets kisses from the bats here. It's also here I was given mysteries from Shy Guys, which is an interesting item to see. And I'll be sure to open them once Bone Toe comes along. Lastly, 99 had two elite wizards, both holding items and one was a stopwatch. Not for a second do I regret ranking up Koops, because even now, Shell Shield serves to be a massive help in avoiding that annoying as heck status element. Then we just knocked out the new Fangled Way, Fire Drive. Overall, it feels like everything useful we were given ended up seeing significant use in the 90s. Double Dip for Elite Wizards, Paracoos for Babolks, Zaptap for Swampires, and both Fire Drive and Sleepy Stomp for Amazing Daisies. Man, I kinda feel bad for Goombella now. She barely got to do much of anything beyond making Swampires die faster. And now, the main event. Upon reaching level 99, I want to also bring up that I did not even level up here. So Goombella may well finally get her chance to shine against Bone Tail, since she is generally recommended to deal damage as quickly as possible. I put the audience throws I got earlier like a Super Shroom from Luigi, and some Dried Shrooms from Punities to good use in maxing Koop's HP out. And with my badges outfitted, it's time to duel with the Demonic Dragon. Okay, why is this music going so hard? Well anyway, I decided to use my boost sheet turn 1 to protect Goombella after the tattle, double dipping the item with a shooting star. Bone Tail proceeds to validate that decision by stopping on Goombella, which triggers the stage jets on my side of the field. And even though Goombella was safe no matter what, it's good that even if I did miss the guard, I would have been able to switch into Koops, where I definitely would have used Shell Shield until Mario thought out. So now I'm on the offensive. Goombella attacks, I switch off for Koops, and now the lack of quick change makes it apparent that odds are I'm not going to be doing much of any fighting with Goombella since I can't attack, bring her out, and act from there. Most of what I can really do now is fire drive and aim for as much damage as possible until I find another opening to bring Goombella back in. Which doesn't take long because upon trying to super guard the breath from there, I miss it and Koops gets knocked out on the second attack. That is very bad. So now there's really not much I can do to protect Umbella later once I bring her back out. That's what I get for having little to no experience with freaking Dragon Breath. So after healing with Sweet Treat, I just bring Umbella in and have her do whatever she can. I still try to Paraloop like on GameCube, so I Sweet Treat only enough where Umbella will be brought back down to 1 HP provided I guard, but it was admittedly doomed to fail. The way regenerated star power is calculated makes being able to refill after one attack impossible, and it can't overflow upon using Sweet Treat in the back. So I'm starting to really feel the nerf this game placed on Goombella now. And sadly, she ends up falling with Bone Tail still having 118 HP left. This is before she's healed even once, by the way. Now it's just Mario alone. We can still win, but we'd really need to learn on the fly how to handle Bone Tail's breath. Because without any healing items, Sweet Treat is all we have. And since it's slow, slow to be restored, we really can't hope to hold out if Bone Tail makes a habit of repeatedly biting us, as guards won't work against it. 
I also make sure to throw out all my attack items, mainly when the status on Mario hinders his damage, primarily Tiny. Around midway, I use my first mystery which gives me... a shooting star. So guess that's three that this game has blessed me with. Multiple turns would pass before anything else noteworthy happened. It's really just me cycling between Fire Drive, Piercing Blow, and Sweet Treat while trying to get a feel for Dragon Breath Guards. Occasionally, Fog would appear for Bone Tail, and if it did, I'd rather appeal since missing would just be a really bad career move. Only have so much FP after all, and I constantly find myself running out. Eventually, I used my second mystery, and it gave me an Ultra Shroom. Not a bad item to get at all, but it probably wasn't too necessary for our survival. I actually missed a Sleep Breath Sanded Guard soon after though, so it honestly could have added a lot more than credit is really being given. My damage now is reduced to being somewhat of a snail's pace, as I'm now opting for Piercing Below when I like the FP for Fire Drive. And this really did start to feel somewhat of a slog, which isn't good because Bone Tail's damage isn't slowing down at all. But then I'm drawn to a Flower Bingo being lined up like a moth to a flame, and recognizing this is my chance, I aim to match it. We are back in business. The view is clear. All that has to be done now is just fire drive until Bone Tail is burned to cinders. I felt myself in a frenzy, knowing I was inches away from the finish line. I was considering using my final Ice Storm here, but didn't really want to because I started telling myself, you don't need to do anything fancy, just win. So I played way safer, mainly just relying on standard guards and pressing A slightly early to make sure I don't get status locked. It just took a few more fire drives to reduce Bone Tail to near death. And after checking her title to see if Gubella would still be able to speak on it, which, well, I am not disappointed, I let one final fire drive rip. Victory! After almost Four hours of enduring the pit of 100 trials, I am happy to announce it has been officially cleared before Hooktail. If you're looking for something else to watch, check out one of my videos on the original GameCube release of this game. Here, I beat all of TTYD using only one partner with Mario doing basically nothing. Would also like to give attention to my channel members Splash A, MB Switchy, and Nintendo 60 Jorts. Thank you so much for your donations, and thank you for watching.